Thank you all for coming out on 1,000 degrees after you've been using 100% humidity. Is that better or not? Um, I was so excited when I saw that the book we were going to use for the CRE this year was Kristen Iverson's book on that, Rocky Flats. Um, it's a story that needs to be told. It's a story that most people who are living outside of the American West and outside of the defense um, communities in the American West are unfamiliar with. And as, as I read it, as, as so, ha so often happens when I look at or talk to um, the research, researchers or research people who are doing work on the other defense um, communities around the country at Los Alamos or um, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, um, I'm uh, shocked by how similar our stories are. Um, and the short version of my talk today is everything that Kristen Iverson said about Rocky Flats holds true for the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and its company town in, of Richland, Washington. Um, here's the long version. <laughs> when I was four years old, my dad took a job at the radio station in Sunnyside, Washington. We have a tall speaker and a short mic, guys. I apologize. Um, when I was four, my dad took a job at the radio station in Sunnyside, Washington, and the street on which we lived, Irving Street, was a little tiny street with 10 or 12 houses, and the only person, uh, the only dad on that street who had a normal job, if you consider being a radio DJ in 1965 to be a normal job, was my dad. He was the only person who went to a business or, or an office for the day. Everybody else who lived on my street got up in the morning, put on work shirts and boots, and piled into um, cars and trucks and carpooled out to a place that they just called the area. And they worked there till the end of the day and came home. Um, but there was kind of a contest uh, amongst these guys. And the contest was, if your dosimeter badge went off, you got to go home early. So there was a bit of a contest amongst the guys in my neighborhood to see who could get home and get playing cards fastest. It was, a, it was a little bit of a joke. It was a little bit of a game. It was a little bit of a way of deflecting the danger of what they were doing day to day in a workplace that was producing the plutonium that was sent to Rocky Flats to produce the little bombs to set off the big bombs. Um, Nobody ever knew what their dad did at work, except me. My dad was on the radio. I talked to him every day. Um, and he would pretend to talk back to us. Uh, nobody knew what their dads did. And we didn't ever refer to it as a bomb factory, a plutonium assembly line, um, a defense installation. We just called it the area. And 25 years after they had started to decommission it, it's still mostly just referred to as the area. Um, folks who lived in my town, which was about 35 miles upwind of, of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, were mostly uh, tradespeople. They were mostly blue-collar guys, electricians, they were in construction, they were janitors. Um, the folks who really made the plant go lived primarily in the company town of Richland, Washington, which is right next to the nuclear reservation, and started life as a closed government-owned company town for nuclear workers who kept the plant secrets. And um, the, the town was managed by the DuPont Corporation, which also ran the um, nuclear plant during the Manhattan Project and the early years of World War II. Um, so the Hanford site started out, the area started out as the Manhattan Project's plutonium assembly line. Manhattan Project, as you may or may not know, was the top secret um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers initiative to build a bomb before the end of the war. Um, and when you look at all of the documents and documentation left by the people who were at the begin, who were at the head of that initiative, their mission was clearly not to build a bomb to end the war. It was just to get a bomb built before the end of the war. Um, and Hanford was chosen as the location for uh, the plutonium site, site because it had everything it needed. It had lots of electric power, hydroelectric power, it had a rail line, and it was really, really far from where anybody else lived. And they, they were very worried about things going wrong and, and people getting hurt. So, they 
started at Hanford in 1941, uh, or I'm sorry, 1943, uh, by six months into the project, they were building Richland, the company town. And they have been in uh, operation for seven years. Seven years ago, last Friday, was the day that the first plutonium um, reactor was turned on. So, as in Arvada, here, let me point without a pointer. Um, Richland is the company town. Everything that is, is green is generally kind of the vicinity, very roughly drawn, of the nuclear reservation. The little red dot, which should be actually off the nuclear reservation, is my hometown. Um, if you drive past Hanford on any of the state highways that skirt the, skirt the reservation, you'll see something that looks like that. A lot of open ter terrain, um, a smokestack, and a bunch of concrete buildings that you can't tell what they are. If you drove into Richland in the 1950s, what you saw was something that looked like one of America's first suburban communities. Um, this is a picture of uh, the Richland Town Center Mall, which was one of the first open-air malls in the United States. Um, that's the Uptown Bowl. That's a bowling alley that's still there. Um, like Armada, the people who ended up living closest to the nuclear reservation in the company town, um, were living a very middle of the middle class suburban lifestyle, post-war. Everybody, everybody was in their 30s, everybody had little kids, everybody had a house with kind of two bedrooms, um, and it was very uh, suburban and kind of atomic age utopia. Um, also like Arvada, nobody in Richland Nobody in my hometown who worked at the area ever talked about their job. Um, I went to high school with the guy who is now the head of security at the nuclear reactor. I saw him at a class reunion a couple of weeks ago. He doesn't talk about his job at all. Um, and, but, but work is very much like a factory. It doesn't feel like a defense installation. It runs the light and assembly line, and the assembly line is just cranking out plutonium. Um, also, like Arvada, the government is keeping secrets about risks at the same time that they are reassuring the public that everything is safe. Um, the mantra at Hanford was that Hanford is as safe as Mother Smoke. Um, and they told the public that for 50 years. Uh, Hanford was, it, it was an interesting metaphor because the chief source of medical consequences for people who lived down when the cancer was thyroid cancer. And the way you got thyroid cancer was smoke jetted out of the stacks, filtered out across the fields, landed on the grass, cattle ate the grass, babies drank the milk, and got thyroid disease. Um, so actually babies who were drinking mother's milk were in good shape, babies who were drinking cow's milk were in not such good shape. Unlike Ar Arvada, though, um, Hanford and Richland were, were from the get-go, very pro-nuke, pro-bomb. Once the secret was out, Hanford and the secret was the secret. Hanford's secret was released on the day that we dropped the bomb on Nagasaki at the end of the war. Um, the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was specifically produced with the material that had been generated at Hanford, and the newspaper heading that day said, "It's peace. Our bombs." So while there was a lot of secrecy about what was going on during the war, by the time the war ended, it was clear this is what we had been working on. So at that point, the secret's out, but the secrecy continues, and the secrecy culture continues. Um, Richland really celebrates its, this is Batman. This is the bomb that we produced um, with uh, plutonium from Hanford. This is the Nagasaki blast. And that's Nagasaki after the war. So the war ends, and the Cold War begins. And Hanford embraces this identity and culture as the Adam Buston village of the West. And there's a very peculiar identity that pulls off of cowboy mythology 
and um, atomic age mythology at the same time. So you see this juxtaposition quite frequently of settlers in a Conestoga wagon pulling the new light of the atomic age across these scrappy high desert of eastern Washington. Um, Hanford operated as a site, as a weapons production site for about 45 years. Um, starting in the late 70s, mid to late 70s, it shifted into um, a mode as an electric power plant as, as other defense reactors came online. Um, people who are my age who grew up in that part of Washington State think of it as an electric power plant. We didn't think of it, think of it as, a, as a weapon plant. It's been decommissioned since the late 1980s, and for the last 25 years, they've been trying to clean it up. Two-thirds of the nation's nuclear waste is there. 56 million gallons of um, leaking nuclear waste are stored in 177 tanks that have been leaking since 1956. Uh, they are using an interesting approach to try and stop, stop groundwater, contaminated groundwater from leaking into the Columbia River, which includes things like injecting molasses into the ground and making and making um, uh, something that's kind of like oil and vinegar dressing and shooting that into the ground. Um, so they're 20, they're, they've got 25 years into the cleanup. They've got at least another 25 years to go. The cost so far has been $36 billion. Um, what I wanted to talk about today in terms of, in the context of Kristen Iverson's book particularly is where do research questions come from? And, and I wanted, to, I wanted to, to offer you my take on some of the criticism I've, I've seen of her work um, with respect to her contention that everything was secret and nobody knew what was going on. Um, because she, she makes, a, to me, a reasonable argument throughout her book Nobody talked about. Nobody talked about their work. People didn't know what was going on, and I've seen criticism in the press that's like, "Oh, that's crazy. We all know what was going on. There's no, there's knowing what's going on and not knowing, and knowing what's going on." So we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, my project started as a bar bet. Uh, I was in a, I was in a dive bar with my friend and poet musician Sean Connery, and he did not believe that the high school down the road from me used an atomic mushroom cloud as their actual school mascot, which in fact they do. And everything, everything that, I'm sorry, Imani, I'm trying so hard to stand in one place and not talk with my hands. Um, everything that the Booster Club sells at, at uh, Richland High School is emblazoned with a mushroom cloud and the phrase, proud of the cloud. Um, so I went home from the dive bar, Googled around, looking for that, that image. And before I found that image, I found this table. And this is a, this is a census data table that shows the population of the Tri-Cities, which, which is where the Hanford Nuclear Reservation is located, um, between 1940 and 1980. You can look down at the very bottom. Um, it shows the population of Richland went from 247 people in 1940 to 21,809 people in 1950. So I looked at that and my reporter brain went, my reporter brain that, that grew up next door to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and had worked as a reporter in that part of the state said, wow, I wonder what was going on in Richland in the 1940s. That's kind of weird. Um, why did they have such a big population bill? So I Googled around and did some primary research. Didn't, I didn't do library research, I just Googled a little bit and discovered, oh, I did not know that that was the plant that the Manhattan Project built to produce plutonium to blow up Nagasaki. Um, so I did more research, and then I started looking in archives, and I started looking at the county museum, and I started looking at the public reading room for the, for the Atomic Energy Commission, and I, became aware of the massive environmental contamination that had gone on um, during, during the plant's operating years. And 
my question changed, and my question became, how do people come to act in ways that will kill others and themselves? That question took shape when I discovered um, uh, research about or information about the Green Run. The Green Run was a top secret government test in 1949 that was intended to figure, the intent of the Green Run test was to release some very toxic nuclear stuff into the sky, see where it went, and by tracking it, see if we could figure out what was going on in the Soviet Union. That's what we thought we were going to do with that test. As with Chris and Iverson's stories about, about the winds and the wind problems in, uh, in Arvada, the winds did not cooperate that night, and all of that radioactive contamination rained down on specific neighborhoods in eastern Washington, and may or may not have caused a whole lot of thyroid cancer. So question number two was driven by something new that I found in the research that I'd never heard of that really changed how I was thinking. By the time I got to question number three, I probably had been doing research for about six months or a year, and my re the research question shifts from a question the first question was a question I would just ask because I'm a curious person. The second question I would ask, probably because I was kind of still in my investigative reporter mode. The third question is a question that I probably would only have asked if I were doing academic research, scholarly research. Um, and the so the difference between those three modes is, one, I just want to know because I'm nosy. Two, I want to know because I'm trying to get to the who, what, when, where, why, how reporters questions so that I can make sense of this, tell a story or make sense of the story. This one, I'm guessing what material discursive and rhetorical factors contributed to secret keeping and secrecy culture. Uh, probably half the words in that sentence are gibberish to most of the people in this room. Um, that question is aimed at trying to find a way to contribute new no a new body of knowledge to the existing body of knowledge in my research field, which is rhetoric. So it's got language that's very specific to that field, and it's also constructed in a very deliberate way in order to situate it into a gap in the existing scholarship in the field. In plain English, what I wanted to know was, how did they make secret keepers? So here's the, here's the short, here's the story that embodies Hanford and its secret keeping myths. Um, secretary in the, in, during the war years leaves her office for lunch. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, um, secretary leaves her office during lunch, um, sees, a, sees a guy out in front of her office, um, fits him to dig a hole. He wasn't digging a hole yet, he was just getting ready to dig a hole. Uh, she comes back from lunch, he's digging a hole. She says, oh, you're still here, what are they doing? He says, I don't know what they're doing, what I'm doing is digging a hole. Um, when Kristen Iverson said nobody asked any questions, that's what she was talking about. I'm fairly confident that's what she was talking about. That's what, that's what everybody who does research on these defense sites um, finds, is that people don't ask questions because they don't want to know the answers, because knowing the answers is dangerous in some fashion. 